Welcome to Human Stories. It's really an opportunity, a great opportunity for me to share my work with you today. And I want to thank the team at Human Stories for making all of this possible. And a special thanks to Mac Graham and Girish Daswani for reaching out to me with the invitation. The title of my talk today is Politics After Art, or How Art Matters. So who am I? Well, I'm an anthropologist and assistant professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at the National University of Singapore. Over the last almost now 15 years, I've been doing research on Palestine, Israel. Particularly, I've been looking at the Palestinians inside Israel, or what people sometimes refer to as the Palestinian citizens of Israel, Palestinians living and working in Israel, or Palestinians of 48. From here on out, I'm just gonna to refer to, to them as Palestinians in Israel. My research has been really focused over this time on the place of art within the Palestinian struggle against settler colonialism. And in particular, I've been interested in this and how art sort of figures in contesting and, and, and in a sense resisting colonization, dispossession and erasure. And much of the literature that's out there has, has sort of focused on a lot of Palestinian art inside the West Bank, the occupied territories, but very little is actually sort of taken up how Palestinians in Israel sort of deal with this situation. So I'm going to talk about that today. And in that sense, I'm very much interested in the relationship between art and politics. Art and politics, this is definitely something we're all quite familiar with. It's a common formula, right? We hear about art and politics in terms of propaganda, but we also can go back to surrealism, Dadaism, the avant-garde, and those ways in which art and politics became entangled with each other. For anthropology though, the, the, the question has largely been framed in terms of the politics of art. We can see different studies sort of stemming out of the work of Pierre Bourdieu, but coming, coming around uh, Jessica uh, Winnegar's work on creative reckonings, but many other works since have looked at the idea of the politics of art. And what that kind of has done is sort of said, to understand art, we need to understand its political context and to understand in particular, the sort of constraints and possibilities of cultural production within these kind of settings. And in a sense that what they're trying to do is elaborate how cultural production sort of takes place within a larger sort of political sort of situation or scenario. But what's often lost and what I feel kind of missing from this work is the artwork itself. I mean, this has been a criticism of Pierre Bourdieu's work is that we hear a lot about art, but we actually never really see the art or there's very little discussion about the art. And so what I've been trying to do over my work over the last years has been to sort of, how do we bring the artwork back into our discussion? Not to sort of, do away with the political context, social context that sort of shape cultural production, but in a sense to complement it. And so I've wanted to sort of say, how would we frame art as an equal partner with politics, rather than in seeing art as a representation or as often is the case, an illustration of political discussions, secondary and derivative in that sense. And how, we, how might we reverse this situation and ultimately displace it? I guess that's the bigger question is how do we displace it? So to do this, I wanna sort of go back to this idea of art and politics. And in particular, I wanna talk about art and politics and focus on the end. And I guess guiding my discussion today will be this idea of how art might not be a matter of telling things differently, but of telling us different things. And this I take from David McDougall, the visual anthropologist, who, make, who sort of brings that up in terms of what visual anthropology can do. So end, art and politics. So following Viveros de Castro's essay, End, who is in himself following the work of Gilles Deleuze, I take the end in art and politics as a generative yet undecidable relator. It allows us to say things about what it relates. Art encounters politics, politics encounters art. Not a mere juxtaposition, nor some sort of union, neither is reducible to the other. The end, in a sense, holds open the relationship. 
So as an anthropologist, I therefore start from the position that I don't know either what art or politics mean, and more importantly, what they do. My task through such questions is to take art and politics as an open-ended relation. As such, I see the relationship of art and politics in art and politics in which both art and politics are sort of made, unmade and remade through each other and in relation to one another. So we, get to, we begin to see how this takes place when we think about something like Mikhail Halak's fragile art and politics. Here we see the, the, the Israeli blue ID, which all Israelis are required to sort of carry with them. But in those IDs, of course, there's a marker of difference. There's a marker of who is Jewish and who is Arab. And here, this in the hyper-realist painting where he sort of takes on this question of the fragility of this, this blue ID that sort of then places you, identifies you, and situates you. Or again, with Dora Bakri, the self-portrait with goat. We see an ambivalent relationship between himself and the goat against a sort of orientalist landscape. And, it, and him dressed in clothing that comes from a store that refuses to hire Arab workers. Maisa Azizi's untitled piece from 2010 with white bars that sort of cross and, and intersect uh, what would be a very typical Arab town, overcrowded, building on top of each other. But these bars as imprisonment, but also these bars as empty spaces, openness. Mahmoud Kais's encroachment, a series of furniture around the living room in which everything is made of concrete and concrete being one of these very ubiquitous materials that sort of throughout, throughout the Middle East, but in particular Palestine, from the building of the, the separation wall to those buildings that get built on top of one another. Manab Mahamid's On the Origin, in which a, a bronze bust has curlers in her hair made of cactus fruit. A reappropriation of a very common symbol for Palestinians, the cactus, but then the cactus fruit is something separate and deriving from. Sama Shahadi's reconstruction. Here, she takes a charcoal drawing and depicts a family sitting at a, for a picnic in a former Palestinian village. As we can, as we can see, given the cacti that sort of populate the landscape, we know there was a former village and you can see the stones in the background. And this is her own village. And the girl in the background playing with the rocks, reconstructing that village. And the women in the foreground, the most front foremost a woman pregnant in, the, in what we can presume is the mother touching her belly. So my question becomes, what can these works tell us beyond sort of saying, let's situate them in the political context, and therefore we can sort of start to sort of put together what they mean. What I'm interested in doing is sort of saying, what can they do that makes us see different things? What can they tell us about occupation, settler colonialism, land, time, as we saw in the beginning with uh, Sharif Waked's To Be Continued, which is a piece that sort of mounts the sort of classical image of the suicide bomber's final testimony, but does it with 1001 and Arabian Nights, so a story that doesn't end. Creating this juxtaposition, if you will, but opening the question of temporality and time. So putting the artwork back into anthropology, much like Alfred Gell had sort of implored us to do in his classic text, Art and Agency. What does art do? What can art tell us about politics? And particularly, what can art tell us about all these different factors within the Palestinian struggle? And most importantly, how might art not be a matter of telling us things differently, but of telling us different things? That's really kind of the, the point I want to get to. So to do this, I'm going to look at one particular art that I'm going to sort of dive into a bit here and to sort of talk about this artwork as a way of thinking through and to demonstrate in a sense kind of what I'm doing. So 
The piece is called Itikan by Nardine Sruji, uh, or I think she names it this, uh, Conjunction. It's a piece that was done in 2012. It was shown at the Haifa Museum, the Beta Geffen Museum Gallery, I should say, which is, Beta Geffen is a, a cultural center for Arab and Jewish coexistence. So the piece had a particular setting as well. So just let me start with a bit of a talk about this piece. Suspended in midair, seemingly defying gravity, an oversized funnel takes over the small room within the exhibition center at Beta Geffen in Haifa. It's constructed of stainless steel, held together by rivets and welding. And the result is this sort of nearly seamless opaque surface that holds up a mirror to the surroundings. We see ourselves as we move around it. So the metal funnel affords a very distinctive industrial quality, right? It's both enduring and it's impenetrable. And placed meticulously right at the bottom of the funnel, the bottom opening of the funnel, is a small glass brown bottle, an almost antiquish bottle, if you will. It creates this particular sensation. We, we, we clearly see the disparity and the, and the sort of asymmetry between this thing. The funnel is just far too large for the bottle. Whatever would actually sort of go through the funnel would never, ever fit in the bottle. The bottle would be overwhelmed. It would explode. So my concern when looking at this piece is not to sort of get into what does it can represent or symbolize, what it means or signifies, but in what it does and how it does it. I start thinking, I start th started thinking with Alfred Gell's claim that every work of art is a trap, right? And I started with this premise that in a sense, what we have here is a trap. It captures us in a sense that it asks us a question. But I'll elaborate on what I mean by that. So let me just outline what I sort of then did in thinking about this work. What I have sort of proposed is that there are three scenes that take place in this artwork. And I, I'm going to sort of elaborate these three scenes and tell you what in, in a sense I'm trying to articulate by, by noting these three scenes. So let me start with the first scene. For many people who've I've shown this work to, there was an immediate sort of feeling of like, oh, this, um, this is such the feeling of what it's like to be at a checkpoint, right? This is the feeling of being choked at the checkpoint. And Julie Petit, an anthropologist in the United States is referred to through her, through her interlocutors in, in Palestine, refers to the checkpoint as a funnel trap in the sense that the checkpoints work in a way that sort of funnel you into this thing that then trap you there. So in a sense, the artwork has this very clear, if you want, depiction of that sort of confrontation, if you will, of the checkpoint and what Palestinians go through when they go through these checkpoints and the industrialness of this sort of checkpoint system, checkpoints that sort of populate the West Bank enormously. But at the same time, for Palestinians in Israel, it's the same thing. The blue ID of Mikhail Halak is a, an example. Maisa Ezezi's town that's sort of then built on top of each other. This sense that you're always feeling trapped and closed in, congested. And, and the word tikan comes from those, has all those sort of words in it. It comes from the idea in, in Arabic of choking, of being congested, of being sort of blocked. But it also, as a verb, sort of connotes this idea of an imminent explosion, something that's on the, the precipice of sort of just igniting. So that's one scene. That's the first scene in a way that, that can be sort of brought out from this artwork. The second scene, which is the scene that is what we're seeing here, is the scene in which this artwork is exhibited, the scene in which it's sort of installed. So Beta Geffen, as I mentioned, is a Arab Jewish cultural center for coexistence in Haifa. It has been around for quite some time and it, it garners a lot of criticism from Palestinians because coexistence itself tends to not really be about coexistence, but about sort of accepting the dominant narrative in which Palestinians live. 
to show it at Geffen is therefore a contentious sort of project, right? And, and Nardine is fully aware of what it means to show at this gallery. And she showed there subsequently after this work in 2012. But what's interesting about this particular piece and this particular sort of installation is that it's put into a small room in the back area of the gallery. And when you walk in this room, you find yourself confined. You find yourself confronted. It's, it's a daunting three meter funnel that sort of is in your face. And you're forced to kind of walk around the outside of the room as you sort of look at it. But then you're also visible in this sort of reflection on the, the, the piece itself. So in this sense, the second scene here that I'm trying to sort of elaborate is that the, the, the funnel actually in this case elaborates or sort of enacts the very thing that it's talking about. So that first scene now gets enacted through the funnel. It does what it is saying. It is doing the very sort of, if you want, obstructing and, and confining of which it's sort of depicting in the first scene. And this is important because I think in this sense, it sort of shifts our, 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 our discussion away from the idea that art is representational, but here art becomes in a sense performative or better performance based. It's a, it's a, it's a site specific work in that sense. So that brings us to the second scene. And in the third scene, is a very different scene, a very completely different scene that would not be obvious to the viewer, or particularly would not be obvious to a non-Palestinian viewer. So this third scene came to me through fieldwork and is something that I sort of elaborated on based on my own experience. And we'll talk, I'll come back to that idea in the end. So in what happens in this third scene is that I find myself sitting in Nardine's family's home. She invited me to meet her family. I had been sort of in Nazareth where her family lives to sort of see other artists. And she sort of said, come by, my family's having dinner, you can join us. And I sat down at the kitchen table with, the, with a couple of the family members and we, we chatted for a bit. And then they got up and all left. Everybody had their things to do and I was left sitting at the kitchen table alone. And I, sat there just looking around the room as in just observing, right? And then I noticed out of the corner of my eye, was the, the, the place where I was sitting was kind of next in the kitchen. It was a large open kitchen. And I noticed her father going from a storeroom in the side across the kitchen out a back door and then back. And what I hadn't noticed at the time that Nardine later pointed out to me and, and sort of made me think when I saw this piece, I thought of it eventually, was that when he went to this back room, he came out with a bottle in one hand and a funnel in another. And at the time, I didn't notice this. There was the imponderabilia, as Malinowski once referred to it. This was just banal, everyday activity. I didn't note anything. There was nothing significant about it. He then sort of passes through the kitchen with the bottle and funnel into the backyard out of my view. And a few minutes later, he comes back through the kitchen with a bottle full of olive oil and the funnel still in his hand. And what I kind of realized later was that this funnel is actually a kind of device that's very fundamental for Palestinians. And as many people explained to me, every Palestinian home has a funnel in it, even many funnels. And the reason being is that to get the olive oil into the kitchen, you need that funnel because Palestinians tend to have their olive oil in large sort of boxes, large sort of like if you want, um, yeah, large, large sort of receptacles in which they sort of then hold the olive oil that's been harvested in the, over the year that they keep, you know, it was harvested in October, they keep it in these sort of large vats. And then they sort of then use the olive oil from those. But to get the olive oil from that into the small bottles, they need a funnel. So in a way, Nardine took a very sort of common, ubiquitous, everyday device and brings it into this scene, if you will, of the artwork. And what interested me about this, as I started to think about it is, 
this is a daily activity. This is a routine. This is almost a ritual, if you will. It is, as I frame it, a refrain. It's a refrain that sort of works to sort of connect the Palestinians from the kitchen to the land, to the oil, all these that sort of in a land of dispossession, in a land, in a place of settler colonialism, where you find yourself further and further confined and constrained, this actually moves in the opposite direction. It actually connects Palestinians across spaces and across times. So this was actually a quite significant sort of way of seeing another scene in this work that in a sense continued or worked alongside the, the first two. So what is this all to say? Like, what do we sort of then come to when we start to think about this idea that the artwork, in a sense, is these three scenes? Well, one of the propositions that I'm putting forward is that we'd stop, this, stop seeing the artwork as this coherent, unified, or if you want, fixed object. And this is a move away from kind of the way that art history and art criticism and museology kind of see the art and offers an anthropological way of thinking about the artwork. And the artwork is doing work. It's working in the sense that it sort of brings together these three scenes. And in particular, what I sort of propose is they actually are an arranging or the artwork is an arranging or in using Deleuze and Guattari's idea, an assemblage or agencement to give a better connotation of what is actually meant by that. So by bringing these three scenes together, we see that the artwork is not just a representation of a checkpoint, nor is it just the performance within the gallery, nor is it just the refrain, but it's all three at the same time. The artwork, in other words, is a multiplicity. It is the sort of if you want, arranging of these three scenes to create a different effect. And it makes us start to think, my argument is that what do we understand by settler colonialism? In particular, how do we understand settler colonialism as a situation? And this presents us a situation. It doesn't resolve it. It doesn't sort of claim to close it, but it opens it up. We have two, in a way, the second, the first scene is a scene of confinement. The second scene is a, is a turning the, in a way, the funnel of that checkpoint back on the viewer. And in this case, the viewer who comes into a coexistence gallery, a Jewish Israeli, and is being confronted with the very sort of thing that they don't necessarily experience themselves in daily life. And the third scene becomes, if you want, a line of flight, a moment of fugitivity not just simple resistance, not that resistance is simple, but not just resistance, but also refusal. It refuses to sort of participate in this sort of, in this sort of larger scheme. It offers a refrain, a way of sort of connecting the home and the land and the movement of bodies in those spaces. So what can this tell us about people today? First off, Artworks do more than represent the world. They are acts of worlding or world making. As we see through this sort of idea that artworks are no longer self contained objects with essences, but instead multiplicities, they are arrangings, they're inventions, they create new scenes, new scenarios. They invent possibilities that might not yet have been imagined. They allow us to see different things. And in a sense, rather than see art as an addition or supplement to life, how might we begin to appreciate artworks as experiments in living? Particularly for Palestinians, how might artworks not just be forms of writing back, of, of, of taking that right to, to sort of narrate one's experience under the sort of hegemony of erasure and colonization, but in a sense, creating other possibilities, creating, if you want, modes of living or forms of life that are not yet there, but are nonetheless sort of, if you want, potentials. So I want to finish with two questions then, given this, and sort of step back, back out from the particularities I'm talking about. How can anthropology attend to these artworks as agencements, as assemblages? 
Well, first thing we have to do is to start to think of anthropology not an, as not an anthropology of art, but to think how we do an anthropology and art. And again, I go back to the idea of the end. The end opens up a relation between anthropology and art. So what does that mean? And, and what does that entail? Well, these scenes that I presented to you around the Tikkun are not scenes that necessarily the artist would have said, yes, those are exactly what I had in mind and that's exactly my intention. These scenes are my own sort of, if you want, assemblaging work, you know, my putting together of different scenes that I see and understand through conversations through with the artist, but also others as they sort of move across and within this work. And what this, this artwork doesn't seriously mean, doesn't just put these scenes together, it is those scenes. And in a sense, that's what anthropology can do. We become, if you want, not necessarily artists, but we become, in a sense, similar workers in terms of how we go about arranging and, and putting together and organizing and inventing life. And this goes back to the, the sort of kind of accepted insight that, you know, the work we do is not separate from the worlds that we try to understand, that in a sense, what we do enacts the very social worlds that we're part of. And I guess this is kind of where I see art having that capacity to do that, but anthropology can also do that. They might do different things in, they might do these things differently, but they nonetheless are engaged in the same sort of end game of thinking about what is the possibility of a life outside of such constraints, outside of such forms of colonization, outside of such forms of erasure and dispossession. And it's to that end that I feel we have to think about anthropology and art as not necessarily one in which art is just a supplement to or sort of a, a, a nice sort of depiction of what we're trying to sort of prove in an argument otherwise. Art allows us to sort of rethink and to reimagine the different sort of political issues that we're sort of confronting. Thank you for listening. And I want to thank all the artists that sort of were shown in these slides, Dorar, Sharif, Mikael, Maisa, Manal, Samar, and Nardine, most especially for being patient with me, with working with her, her works for many years and trying to sort of just work through these ideas. Thank you very much. Peace and light to you and yours. So I, I you know, I sometimes do this and do that. And